Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Titusville City Council meeting of May 28th, 2019 at 5.30 p.m. We have a quorum. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, first order of business is invocation. Are there any ministers or anyone who would like to say the invocation? If not, please join me in a moment of silence. Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First item is special recognitions and presentations. Mr. City Manager. Yes, sir, uh, Deputy uh, Inspector Chief Hutchinson uh, will present uh, a recognition of our Officer of the Month for the month of April 2019, Officer Kenneth Nelson. Well, good evening. We're honored to um, recognize Detective Kenny Nelson. Uh, for the month of February this year. Um, Detective Nelson is assigned to the Game Over Task Force, which is an extremely um, productive unit made up of several officers from each agency in the county. Uh, it's run by the Sheriff's Office, but it's instrumental in catching very violent suspects. And in the month of February, Detective Nelson was instrumental in making four arrests in four different cases, two of them involving uh, shooting suspects and two of them involving um, victims of violent sexual battery. Um, he is constantly putting himself in harm's way to catch these violent criminals. And at the same time, he's on our SWAT team and gets called out several times a month and helps with the training. And so he's a very, very productive officer, and we're very proud of him for City Employee February item sir yes sir the staff from the East Central Florida Regional Planning Council will present a resiliency plan for the city at the City Council's regular meeting on May 25th at 630 the city staff will recommend approval of the plan as a monitoring tool to be updated with the next evaluation and appraisal report EAR comprehensive plan update <coughs> cycle that uh, staff should develop a high sea level rise uh, design elevation for cap for capital improvement and planning purposes. Mr. Glenda is here to introduce our um, guest. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. So uh, the Department of Environmental Protection awarded a grant to the city to implement some coastal management element policies related to the Florida Legislature's Peril of Flood Act. And so the city contracted with East Central Florida Regional Planning Council, and we've got PJ Smith here tonight, um, to give a presentation on the work that they've done in the last few months. Um, tonight's meeting is just the presentation of the findings from that report, and then at tonight's 6.30 meeting, uh, the city staff will be recommending approval of the plan as a monitoring tool to kind of track um, and update every seven years with our evaluation and appraisal report. So that, I've got PJ. It's uh, good to be here. Thank you for having me, uh, to give me the opportunity to speak about this report, which our um, office has been working on these kinds of reports for 
about a decade, we have geographic information systems, which allow us to put natural hazard data and parcel data and land use data into maps and overlay that information so that we can come up with a really um, good risk assessment for your city and um, guide steps into the future. So um, the Resilient 2020, uh, Resilient Titusville 2020 report, um, as, as Eddie said, was a Department of Environmental Protection grant. Um, and as part of that, we conducted a vulnerability assessment. We reached out to the public. Um, we went over some draft strategies so that you can get some costs um, associated with d different mitigation methods, such as seawalls or raising streets or th and things like that. And, and then at the end, we really brought it all together um, with the draft resiliency plan that we came up with. The draft resiliency plan is a starting point for the city, and it has recommendations over multiple terms, short, intermediate, and long term, um, that could guide the city to become more resilient. Um, so what is resiliency exactly? Um, well, as part of the East Central Florida Re Re Regional Resiliency Action Plan, we had a lot of jurisdictions in Brevard and Volusia County come together, and our stakeholders came up with this definition, the capacity of individuals, communities, institutions, businesses, and systems within a region to plan, collab sustain, adapt, recover, improve, and grow collaboratively, uh, regardless of what kind of chronic stresses and acute shocks they experience. Now, chronic stressors and acute shocks are two very different things. Um, a chronic stressor could potentially be um, the diversity of your workforce economically. A uh, short-term shock could be something such as nuisance flooding or a hurricane event. So we have to look at both short-term and long-term vulnerabilities posed to the city. <clears throat> so as I stated earlier, the report really had four sections. Number one, the vulnerability analysis. Number two, a survey and workshops. We had two workshops with citizens and that um, citizen input actually retroactively affected the um, vulnerability assessment. You'll see that we cover water quality. That was because water quality was one of the highly identified um, potential hazards uh, deteriorating water quality that could affect the city. Um, and then the resiliency themes and strategies, which is really a good part of the plan. It puts numbers to, different, to certain types of strategies. Um, and then the resiliency plan itself. So the vulnerability analysis, really what I'm gonna show on the screen, don't really look at the numbers, just um, kind of go with the idea of what we were trying to accomplish here. So when we looked at the vulnerability analysis for things like storm surge, sea level rise, um, flooding, we looked at the financial impacts, so to property values, financial values, to land use, so what types of land uses are in your different hazard zones. Um, which critical facilities are in which hazard zones, and then finally, your transportation and infrastructure, and we looked at those as well. Um, so the vulnerability assessment hazards, we had storm surge, sea level rise, nuisance flooding, combined flooding, and water quality. This is uh, just an example of the type of table that you can come up with with ArcGIS. So, um, you'll see on the left-hand side, those are all of your different hazards. And then in the second column from the right, you can see what the financial exposure is within the city under certain scenarios. So um, you'll notice that some of these hazards happen every decade or so, maybe twice a decade. Um, and then some of them are, um, like sea level rise, are hazards that we don't exactly have a perfect handle on yet. And you'll see in our report that the sea level rise has different curves. So one of our suggestions with the sea level rise is really to watch those curves over time and try to notice and mark where the water is going up over time because those projections are likely to change um, but the range of the sea level rise curves is, is is something that doesn't give you really good probabilities to do a complete risk assessment so we looked at three different curves as part of our analysis um, we also looked at the critical facilities so this table shows on your left all of the critical facilities um, that are impacted by at least one of the hazards in the report. And then this table basically summarizes across, based on storm surge, the FEMA flood zones, uh, which uh, hazards those uh, critical facilities are vulnerable to. And then the map on the right color codes how many individual hazards each one of those critical facilities um, is projected to be um, uh, impacted by over time. We also looked at the transportation impacts. You can see here that this is the roadway by classification. So you got your major roads, your principal arterial roads. Um, but we also, within each section of the report, looked at individual roads and we named those roads 
um, that, that were vulnerable to certain hazards. Um, so storm surge, I'm gonna flip through a vulnerability assessment pretty quickly, but just to give you an idea, on the left you have the actual storm surge zones, and then for every hazard we did this, on the right hand side there you have the actual land uses within the category five zone. On the left here you have the um, transportation network uh, color-coded, the network is color-coded by which zone it is, and then on the right hand side you actually have the parcel value per square foot um, within those hazard zones. So the brighter zones within those hazard zones are your high financial exposure areas. We wanted to color code the map so that you could really zoom in um, and see what was going on. Now we also did zoom ins to your downtown area and to the State Road 50 um, in Indian R River Lagoon area for each of the hazards. So this is basically multiplied by five. As we go across sea level rise, you'll see that the same, same maps exist. The 100 year FEMA flood zones, nuisance flooding, and nuisance flooding is high tide flooding that over time, really close to the lagoon, as you have a flooding event and a high tide uh, event merging together, uh, that shows the areas that'll potentially be impacted by nuisance flooding over time. It's a much smaller hazard zone. And you can see that the downtown area is where a lot of this is projected to happen. It just, uh, so it, it, that's just the way it is because of the elevations present. And then down near State Road 50, there's actually a riverine system down there. So I believe that's where that bulb out comes from. We also looked at infrastructure exposure to your stormwater outfalls um, and other um, types of infrastructure. Okay, so as part of the public workshops, um, the first one was really an introduction into what resiliency is. And we had the residents uh, name what were their top vulnerabilities. And we, we educated them a little bit, but we didn't want to direct them too much. But it was actually pretty consistent um, that what we covered in the vulnerability analysis actually were what they believed those hazards were. Um, and you can see there on the left-hand side, we have the vulnerabilities. And then on the right-hand side, the strategies that under each of those vulnerabilities, the citizens thought they could deal with. Um, that's how they could, thought they could deal with them. Um, we also looked at potential future population areas and future drawback areas. Critical post-storm uh, locations. Uh, critical post-storm roadways. So it's, it's really about identifying from the citizen's perspective after a hurricane or say a tornado event, although it's rare, what do they need to be operational right after the fact that would make a big difference in their life? The MetroQuest survey, you can read through um, here what some of those results were. As you can see, water quality was once again at the top of their list for um, things they were trying to protect and not allow turn into a major vulnerability over time. Here's the final portion of the MetroQuest survey. My contact information will be made available after um, the presentation, so if you have any specific questions, please don't hesitate to give me um, a call or an email. Um, the resiliency themes and strategies, this is where it all comes together, and frankly, this is what a lot of um, these types of studies are missing. Um, they look at what the vulnerabilities are, but what can you actually do about it? So our resiliency themes and strategies, I'm gonna have to get four resiliency themes. Now under each of those themes, there are specific strategies. And I really um, think that you would enjoy reading this portion of the report just so that you can really get down to those strategies and what can actually be done. So there's an example for each of the um, strategies we came up with. We had a little picture example of it. We looked up a case study of how much these costs and we did a um, description. So as you can see, this is under the adapt and protect um, strategy another adapt and protect, so you've got eight more strategies there. And those are the final strategies. Adapt and protect is the really heavy one. Then you've got retreat. You've got areas that are potentially extremely dangerous. I mean, extremely low in elevation um, that over time, maybe it's an undeveloped area that you retreat away from and you change some of the land uses there to be a bit, little bit less intensive so that over the long term, your financial exposure is lower prepare and recover, and I'm sorry the title is not um, fully uh, available there. 
but just different types of plans and coordination also with the federal, state, um, and county, especially the county EM department is really number one. And then mobilize and educate. And we've worked with a lot of cities around the region, even around the state, and we even look to the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, the South Florida Regional Planning Council, to see what some of them have done. And there are some really cool educational materials, such as what people can do to their lawns um, with the drainage into the lagoon to make a, a less nitrogen and phosphorus go into the lagoon and things like that. Things can really, that can really make a difference. So the resiliency plan, um, I really recommend that you guys uh, read that portion because not everything in the resiliency plan is meant to be um, fully adopted at year zero. These were really um, just a multitude um, of strategies that we came up with, gauging our, um, you know, our themes and our strategies, what can actually be done and what are some steps that the city um, could take over the short, intermediate, and long term to start to deal with some of these issues. Um, some uh, of our primary recommendations were identifying adaptation action areas or areas where, say, the building code could be adapted, um, land use policies could be changed, um, and those are area where the areas where there are potentially confluences of, cert of multiple natu natural hazards in one area, such as the downtown area. Uh, monitoring sea level rise, I can't stress that enough. If you're gonna be putting money into investment on critical infrastructure, you need to have a very definitive sea level rise curve, or at least one a little bit closer than they are now. I will say that by the year 2100, uh, the curves, curves rave, uh, range, the low curve is about two and a half feet and the high curve is about eight and a half feet. So there is quite the difference there. Um, so that it's very important that over time you guys monitor those, um, those curves. And then what we did in the report was we actually set a baseline of three feet in one of the appendices. So we, um, we provided you a listing of all of your critical facilities um, that are within that range, three feet or lower. So you do have at least a baseline um, at a, a value, the three feet value that the staff at the city agreed upon was an appropriate uh, value to analyze. Um, there is my contact information and uh, I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions, uh, Member Nelson? Well, I have some for you and I have some for Eddie. So I'll, I'll split it. And so, <laughs> here comes Eddie. BJ, explain King Tide. I, I mean, I've heard it before, I've heard that term used before, but I don't right. specifically a, recall what it. A king tide is basically an anomaly tide. I'm not a climate scientist, by the okay. way. I really focus on urban planning. I wanted to put that out there, I, uh, okay. geographic information systems, but a king tide is an anomaly tide um, that basically, we have semi diurnal tides here in Florida. It's basically okay. two high tides and two low tides a day. The king tide is when there's a major fluctuation in one of those high tides. Um, luckily, however, you guys are on the lagoon, and the lagoon does not have as high of tidal fluctuations as the, um, the barrier islands do, especially okay. the Atlantic. So. Uh, I, you may not know the answer to this, but I, had, I think I had heard that phrase used in conjunction with Miami Beach. Yes, and Fort Lauderdale, right. Okay. And, and it's also highly um, tied into nuisance flooding. So for example, I was in, um, on a bright and sunny day, I was in Fort Lauderdale three years ago, this actually connects, and there okay. was about a foot of water on the street right in front of the beach on a nice sunny day, and that's because of the confluence of that high, high tide with just a shallow rainstorm. It's, it's really, um, and I'm not an engineer either, uh, but it has to do with backlogs in the infrastructure and piping systems and potentially backflow that can occur when your system can't deal with those types of situations. Okay. And so these are the Eddie questions. <laughs> so you want to sit down. <laughs> so the Eddie question is, I was looking at sustainability and they were talking about um, the green parking lots and, um, wait a minute. Did you say green, was, green parking lots? Yeah, the, the parking lots that have the Landscaping, like bioswales? Right, yeah. No. Like impervious pavement? Yes, yeah. oh. thank you. Pervious but it, pavement. But this was pervious. Okay. It was like, Peggy knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was thinking about that. I was thinking about the green building and do we have um, 
some kind of something to encourage people maybe to use those methods, green building, solar, um, some kind of perk to get people to use those those kind of things as opposed to she's passing the ball. She, she's staring at me awkwardly, but um <laughs> it's the only way I know to stare. <laughs> <laughs> um so we don't currently have an incentive for, uh, well, other than giving credits for um, your impervious area on the lot, if you wanted to substitute your um, concrete for some pervious pavers, you could do that in, say, like the area of critical concern where you have to be mindful of how much um, impervious surface you have. But I do want to separate the issue of sustainability from resi resilience. Um, sustainability is going to be more of our efficiency of operations and right. green, go green energy. Um, whereas resiliency, what we're talking about tonight, is more of an event situation and how to rebound, help the city um, get back on its feet after an event. And I, and I guess as I was going through it, I was like, okay, there's resiliency, but here's green building, mm -hmm. and it can't hurt to have green building. And if we all had green building, right. maybe we wouldn't have to be reading quite so much of this. Gotcha. So one of one of the strategies that's in the report um, is introducing enhanced building standards, like um, either elevated buildings or um, um, what are they called? Um, not floodways, but basically the breakaway walls. The breakaway walls. Yeah. So there's there's strategies that, for example, in other communities where the velocity zone is delineated, which we don't have velocity zones here in Titusville because we're not um, on the beach, but um, there are enhanced building standards that have to be met for those types of properties. And okay. so one thing that we could do here in the city of Titusville is if we know that there are areas that are um, more vulnerable than others, we could identify these adaptation action areas. And so any buildings in these areas would have to be um, built to a, an elevated standard that would make them a little more vul uh, less vulnerable. Okay. Okay. That answers the question. I don't know how the rest of the council feels, but I just sort of feel like maybe at some point we need to look at incentives for doing green building and doing uh, those parking lots. And maybe that's not something that we take up tonight, but I think it's something as we go along that we ought to add incentives for people who are doing that. Very good. Anything else? I'll be quiet. No, that's all right. You did good. <laughs> <laughs> Member Stokel. Thank you for the presentation. Lots of useful information. I really appreciate the strategies. With the strategies, were you able to suggest or rate what you f felt would be best for our particular city? Yeah, we actually, um, we were gonna actually do a zero to five rating um, for the citizens, um, but what we actually decided to do was we have printouts okay. that um, every citizen got, I believe two dots per category, and oh, they put their dot the next to their favorite <laughs> They put them next to their favorite okay. strategy, um, and we can provide that information as well. In, in okay, yeah, that might report. be helpful. And then I guess that would go back to, I guess, Eddie, maybe like, what would be the next step? So with that, and then do we balance that with what our actual budget is and what we can afford? What, what would be the next steps moving forward? So the next step is going to be looking at uh, what kind of design standard we want our, our um, infrastructure departments to be looking at. Do we, do we want to set the three feet? Um, is that economically feasible? Um, so it'll be a, um, a discussion that we'll have to be had on, on what to set that bar at. And then afterwards, like I mentioned, this report, this plan would be a, a monitoring tool so that in ev okay. every seven years we'll look again at the curves and update and see if, if we are seeing some impacts even sooner than we projected, then we need to um, go ahead and take some further action. Okay. And then one more question for you, PJ. I was just curious, with this raising roadways, I know that this was a pretty hot topic down south mm -hmm. and mixed feelings on both sides. Have yeah. you seen in your opinion, I guess, information on what seems to work best? Um, well, I do have somewhat limited exposure to them. Um, they can be somewhat awkward in terms of the elevation of adjacent properties. Um, right. And there also could potentially be the drawback of having um, stormwater wash off into adjacent properties. So that is one thing. But in South Florida, especially, yeah, did you just say that? Yes. Uh, they, yeah, yeah, they've been implementing these. That's right. That, uh, yes, right. I remember that. Yeah, um, but uh, especially in your urban environments, you kind of want the sidewalk and the road system to be on the same plane as that adjacent development. So 
um, there would have to be some special care taken into where to where to put those systems Absolutely. as to not make it too awkward. I'll, I'll also add real quick that elevating roadways is very expensive. Yeah. The pumping. Well, that's what I, I know. That was, I felt like I think that was might have been the most expensive one up here. It's like, oh, that's a nice yeah. price tag there. Yeah, that so. and water pump systems, which they're doing in Miami Beach, where they really have the tax yeah. base to be able to do it. Okay, thank you. Can I just go right in. And <clears throat> I'm sorry. What is, can you describe a breakaway <clears throat> wall? So a breakaway wall is going to be a wall that's um, the the structure is elevated and it allows for the it's it's designed to allow the flood water to break those walls out versus having the structure kind of at the elevation where the flood waters would rush in and damage the actual structure. So basically, it's a pass through for the flood water to go under the structure. So basically, what they do in the islands. Mm -hmm. Okay, that explains it. Thank you. That's interesting, uh, Member Jordan. Yeah, thanks for the presentation. It was really good for sure. Uh, I noticed that you had two critical areas that certainly concerned me. One was Parish Medical Center. Right. And yeah. then you've got the Morning Dove. Is that the name of it? What are you looking for the, the hospital? To oh, do? yeah. Well, <laughs> that's a tough one. Well, I, I believe to the east of the hospital is all undeveloped right now. I would say first critically uh, it would potentially not be the best idea to develop that area. Um, but for the hospital itself, having emergency procedures in place for, um, for hurricanes is number one. That's really internal to the hospital. The hospital staff can also work with the county um, emergency management department um, because they do a lot of trainings and they hire consultants to do con trainings with large business owners like that. Um, yeah, so the great strategy is to look at your highest impact um, areas such as the parish medical center and the college um, and work with their staffs at a high level to make sure that all their emergency plans are in place for after a hazard event. Um, uh, in terms of the, the parcel being there, it's going to get hit by something at some point. There's going to be some flooding on the property. It's how do you bounce back from that that we're trying to focus on. P PJ, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I was just going to ask about the water plant. The Morning Dove. Oh, is that the water reclamation yeah. facility? Yeah, yeah so. Yeah, it's never good to have, especially your, your lift stations, your wastewater systems uh, away. It's mm -hmm. good to have those away from the flood area. So that's a decision that would have to be made. Facility relocation is one option mm -hmm. um, yeah. for the city. But again, these are, mm -hmm. um, especially with sea level rise, with chronic conditions that would completely inundate that property over mm -hmm. the long term. Um, once again, it's very critical to know when sea level rise is going to occur because when you're doing these 30 year infrastructure plans, it's really good to know when that breaking point is going to be. Um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend facility relocation in, in, in some of those areas, especially if they're under that three foot threshold. Okay. Thank really, you, sir. Really quick, just two points I wanted to make, and PJ, correct me if I'm wrong, but the maps that we showed tonight show the, um, uh, the high curve, correct? Yep. yep. So when you're, we're considering that range of between two and eight feet, um, the, the higher curve is what was used to show the the inundation from sea level rise and all that. So it's kind of a worst case scenario projection, sh trying to show that you know, if, if, if it were to come, uh, that that's what would happen. It's not saying what's most likely to happen or, um, so, so keep that in mind. And then um, the other point I was gonna make is that I just came back from a conference in the city of St. Augustine where they had a similar situation to have a wastewater uh, treatment facility on the water. And they're looking at building a, um, a wall around their uh, their facility there and so they they have different cost estimates um, based on what level of uh, what strength of hurricane they want to design it to and the, the, they did a cost benefit ratio to des decide what was best for them I'm not saying that's what we need here we're not I, I don't know that we're seeing those kinds of impacts yet but uh, in St. Augustine they, they get slammed with every hurricane right. and yeah that cost benefit portion is, is critical vice mayor Thank you, and again, a good presentation expediently. Um, in some of the smaller writing, and it's all small for me, um, I was reading an area where it talked about um, a flood evacuation, hurricane evacuation. It talks about north of Garden Street, and you go to 46, maybe take 95 off of 46, maybe keep going west. Then it speaks to Highway 50 West, similar uh, thought. 
I don't know that this is really part of your study, but it's something that crossed my mind that I'd like to make sure we're out there, and that is that uh, if you're going west on 46 or west on 50, you've got some real concerns if you're having a storm surge with uh, St. John's River. I'm not sure how good it's going to be to go west on, especially 46. I've seen floods so many times, but this last uh, rainmaker we had certainly had the St. John's up on the edge of Highway 50. So as we speak of the evacuations on 46 and 50, I would just have some concerns about that. I, um, I, I should reference you. Um, so our office last year did a report for the Space Coast TPO. If you go to our website, ecfrpc.org, um, right on the front is the Space Coast TPO sea level rise assessment. And we actually looked at the, um, of all the critical roadways, all the evacuation routes, railroads, major roadways, we looked at what their elevation was. And we also did a vulnerability analysis countywide uh, for good? that, especially for the vulnerability route. So I would definitely direct you to that report. OK, and I will go there. Perfect. That still doesn't change my vision of Highway 46 being covered in right. water. Right. Well, that report, I, I, I just can't remember that report would show if it was. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you. I have one question for you. Uh, I'm fascinated with this breakaway walls concept because mm -hmm. uh, I live on the water. And during her, uh, Hurricane Irma, we had broke breakaway walls, but we didn't intend them to be breakaway. Uh, so they washed away, is what you're saying? <laughs> no, yeah. they broke away. Yeah. The pounding of the surf. Right. And once it did, the erosion was horrendous. Right. How do you control the water once it, once the wall is gone? Well, there's also the seawall option, um, but really it depends. It's actually highly variable what part of the lagoon you're on, like if, or even the, the thinness of the lagoon. So if there's boats going through, uh, those boats can create a refractory effect of waves going back and forth. But luckily you guys are on such a wide portion of the lagoon uh, that it's really not as much of an issue. Although I, I completely see what you're saying. Um, the seawall could be potentially be a better option. Seawalls are also not perfect. I believe they have a lifetime of about 30 to 40 years. And sometimes the water can even creep underneath those and inflict it from the other side. So you've got water hitting on on both ends. Um, but the good news is you guys don't have a thin lagoon because that can really make it a horrible bathtub type of situation, if that makes sense. Um, but yeah, so that's, again, each uh, we break down their themes and strategies in terms of property improvements, green infrastructure, gray infrastructure. So that's really a, a individual property owner's decision on what to do. And it seems like the seawalls may be a, a better option, even though they're not perfect. Again, we, 30 we, to 40 years. We had seawalls. Right. I mean, standard seawalls. And right. then we had to uh, create a whole different type of seawall, raise it, and widen There's it. There's actually a, another option, too, which is uh, green infrastructure. It's the living shorelines, where you have your um, uh, uh, mangrove systems, uh, what else, sea oats, I believe, um, even oysters, they can actually stop, they, they grow at such a rate that they stop that wave energy action. So that's actually a more low cost solution. Um, and I forgot the guy's name, but there is a guy who goes around the state. I can give you guys an inf his information and he's just an expert in those. We're, we're doing that in the county. Perfect. County wide, they're trying that in different areas. And But one of the issues with the lagoon is it's very shallow. Right. And the wave effect is created very easily because of the, it's like a, a shallow right. bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, when, it, when it rocks, it creates a bigger thing because of the shallowness of it. And I'm glad you said that. What he does is he actually breaks the strategies down into deep, like right off the shore if it's deep or if there's a gradient. Yeah, it makes uh, a big difference. And he, yeah, and, he, there's, and there's different strategies for each. And there's also the high wake, low wake, um, different strategies for those as well. So there's different sorts of living shorelines for different contexts. So I'll be interested in, in reading more on that. But I thought I saw a light, but I didn't see one. Well, so. Yes you or no? saw, <laughs> well, you saw a light, but I was, I was like, um, and maybe Eddie or Peggy, Peggy can address this. My understanding is Harp Point had a wave attenuation device on the docks, and that's why their shoreline didn't get mm -hmm. ruined. And I don't believe your place has that wave attenuation device. Mm -mm. So I'm wondering if that's the difference. I, I've heard of them, and I, you know, we're, we're looking about everything to see yeah. how we can. We we have to get everything back together in the first place, in yeah. the first, and then go to the others. But um, anything else? That's Thank from you. Laura Thank Lee. You. That's from yes. Laura Lee. Yeah, I, I've and, talked to her. Okay. And we have an erosion map in the appendix of the report as well, so you can see the high erosion areas and low erosion. Right. 
Any other questions from council? Seeing none. I thank you, sir. Very nice presentation. Right, thank you. Appreciate it. Next item, Mr. City Manager. Sir, Moore Stevens Lovelace conducted the 2018 TIFA LLC audit in accordance with the counting principles generally accepted in the United States. At the February 28, 2019 meeting, the TIFA LLC Management Committee accepted the 2018 audit. A representative from Moore Stevens Lovelace uh, is here and will present the audit um, and respond to any questions council may have. Sir. Good evening, sir. Your name, please, for the record. Yes. Hi, I'm Terrence Wilson. I was the audit manager on the engagement, and uh, I wanted to thank you all for having me here. Um, first, to start off, we, we did issue an opinion on the audit. It was a clean, unqualified opinion. Um, we also noted during our audit, it's not designed necessarily to identify control risks or uh, control issues. Um, but during the, the procedures that we do, we do walk through the controls. We do observe certain things. We're just not specifically designing our audit just on a control function basis. We did not notice any issues regarding the control environment of TIFA. Uh, the results, financial results that, that are included in the financial statements are as, as we would expect given the, the nature of TIFA and the stage that it's in. As I'm sure you all know, the um, construction of the well fields has, has been completed now for a couple of years. So at this point, it's just functioning as it was designed to function, um, status quo for the moment. Um, other than that, uh, you know, as part of our audit, obviously there's, the big issue is the water sales kind of how do we get our, our comfort around that. Luckily, you guys have the meters out there. You go out and read the meters. Representatives from both the city and Farmton go out every month, read the meter so that then they can invoice. We observed that meter reading. We tagged along on, on the December uh, meter reading, went around to each well, viewed the meter reading, took our notes, made sure that we had the numbers correct. Then we went back to our office compared those numbers to the meter reading we did last year to kind of test the, the, the revenues that the city's been charged from TIFA. And uh, I'm happy to report that that testing came out um, correct and accurate. Um, other than that, looking at the, the balance sheet, you have a very strong balance sheet position, only minimal liabilities. Obviously, the large, uh, the large assets included there are the the wells themselves, the fixed assets, which are being depreciated and amortized over a period of time. Um, other than that, there's really not anything new to report from our report last year. If you have any questions, though, I'd be, I'd be happy to answer. Any questions from council? I see none. Thank you, sir, for your report. Thank you very much for your time. Next item, letters of appreciation, sir. Yes, sir, I'd like to read for the record the letters of appreciation for this month. Uh, Tommy Duncan, firefighter paramedic. Connor McBride, firefighter paramedic. Ariel Burgess, meter technician. And Henry Carmichael, crew leader two from the Water Resources Department. Thank you, sir. Next item is petitions and requests from the public present. Would anybody like to speak? Sir, your name and address for the record, please. Sure, my name is Richard Kern, uh, business address 3700 South Washington. Uh, I work with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, Rod with uh, Rodney Honeycutt. Um, uh, I'm here tonight just to briefly talk about uh, uh, a subdivision project that we've gotten approved, uh, uh, Berkshire subdivision. It's uh, an 80 acre project. It's at near the corner of uh, Garden Street and um, uh, 95. And um, um, since it, we, we've received a, a approval letter from the city staff and, and, and sketch plat approval from the council, uh, we we're, we're now currently held up and moving forward uh, with the construction of the project by by uh, by, by city staff at, at this point in time. Uh, there are two issues that have arisen, and um, I'm seeking uh, council to uh, direct direct staff on on them possibly. So, the uh, the project is located in the area of uh, of uh, critical concern and. Um, 
Um, one of the provisions of your land development code is that any projects in the area of critical concern um, install either wet or dry uh, uh, re reclaimed uh, water mains. And um, this project was approved, uh, approved, approved without those. Um, so uh, basically we're, we're seeking, uh, it's my understanding that the closest reclaimed water line the city has is, is about, about two miles away on Garden Street. And that uh, furthermore, uh, we've learned that um, uh, it's highly unlikely that the city would, would ever have volume of water to, to uh, provide for this project in the, in the future. So we're, we're seeking uh, uh, basically to um, request the city council approve the advisability to authorize the city staff to, to, uh, to, uh, to look in, into this issue. Uh, that's, one, that's one item. And the second item is, um, uh, there's also a provision inside the city code itself. It's uh, about, about about development in the area of critical concern. Um, it's under section 3207A2C. It says uh, for developments having elevations both above and below the 25 year uh, above and below the elevation 25 means sea level. Those portions of the site which are above 25 means sea level shall conform to the performance in paragraph A1 above and all required retention ponds improvements shall be located in the areas of, above uh, of the, the uh, 25 feet uh, mean sea level. So there's, um, when the city staff approved the project, they had a certain interpretation of, of that clause and uh, now now the project's being held Sir, up. your time is up. Do you need additional time? Uh, about two minutes at most. Move to give him an additional. Two motion and second. All those in favor say yes. Yes. You have your time. Um, the, um, anyways, when the city staff, engineering staff approved the project, it, they had a certain understanding of what that clause meant. And, 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 and the project um, conformed to, to, to that understanding. Now we're being held up because the, the, uh, the, uh, the city staff uh, feels that there may be a alternate uh, in, in interpretation on that clause. So we're, we're also, Seeking the council um, uh, to approve the advisability to authorize city staff to, to, to work on the clarity of, of this issue on, under section 3207A2C of, of, of the city code. All right. Um, any questions for this gentleman? Well, be, be, before you do, I'm going to make a comment on the first part. Um, I have some problems with that issue, the first one. Uh, of the pipes going across 95 and so forth. That seems to me is a great expense for something that may or may not ever happen. Uh, so I would have no issue with looking into the comprehensive plan on that. Um, we can handle that as a separate item. I want to have a motion on that item. Uh, move to approve advisability to, now we have to write, look at it. Um, to look at the where it says, policy 5.2.4 uh, requiring that new developments in the area of critical concern being required to connect to the reclaimed water system prior to occupancy mm -hmm. and, or to provide dry lines for future consideration. Uh, motion, I have a second. Second. I second. You were nodding when she was talking, which. <laughs> <laughs> You won on the, on the voice count. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say yes. Yes. Any opposed like sign. Now the second item I'll open to council. Okay. Go right ahead. Can you explain this a little bit more sure. to me it's and explain what you're after and what the city's after? Sure. So the, um, the project is a project of a, 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 a uh, extreme uh, grade changes. We have elevations as low as uh, 18. We have elevations as high as um, 58, approximately. So uh, a portion of the project is above elevation 25, and a portion is is below is a uh, is a uh, is below elevation 25. Okay. Um, the code says that um, uh, stormwater ponds 
serving the area above elevation 25 are supposed to be um, in in the areas of this uh, uh, of the project that are above elevation t t uh, 25. So um, what that what our interpretation of that means and and, and the uh, the way this the project was approved was that we are uh, filling some of the areas that are lower, actually br br bringing them up above uh, elevation 25. We're, um, when the project is finished, we will actually have more land above uh, elevation 25 than, than there currently is. And, and it's my understanding that's, a, that's a beneficial for the, for, the, uh, for the recharge over there. Um, in addition to that, we are retaining the entire 100-year storm event on site no water, no water is leaving our site. We're percolating everything back into the ground uh, on our project. So um, uh, basically because those two items, we, we feel we, we have, have more than com complied with the intent of the code. Um, the alternative viewpoint is that um, whatever runoff comes from areas above elevation 25 can only be uh, um, stored in a retention pond built over land that has existing elevation 25. And we're storing it, um, we're, we're actually improving some land, bring, raising the grades up higher, even, even importing some dirt, um, raising the ground up higher uh, so, we, so, so, we can, so we can actually uh, put, put, put our ponds in land that is, is currently not above elevation 25 on the existing condition, but once we fill it, it uh, uh, our ponds will be above uh, elevation 25. So that's the, that's the, the, the crux of the matter is whether or not the land, the, we were required to put our ponds over land that's existing above 25 or as in our case proposed above 25. So the way I read it was that you had to put the stormwater in areas that were currently under 25. Am I, is that the way the city is reading it? Well, the city engineer, uh, approved it with, not without uh, uh, understanding. It was, it was uh, Ms. Busaka, what, what is it? if you will, please. Please. <laughs> no, don't go anywhere. <laughs> the project was approved bec with 100%, well, let me go back. As Mr. Kern said, the requirement is that the one, the 10 year storm event, all of the water from the 10 year storm event remain on site. Correct. In this case, the water from the 100 year storm event is all going to remain on site, okay. which is a lot more water. So when it was approved, it was approved as this more than meets the intent of the code, which is that the recharge on, that is currently happening on that site will continue to happen because the water that's falling down there now will stay on there. There is no discharge. Okay. The engineer felt that that was um, protecting the aquifer and meeting the intent of the code. Okay. We have received um, some written information from a citizen who has stated that they disagree with that interpretation. And because of that, um, there is, as you can imagine, some hesitancy in moving forward because even though the, the preliminary plat is approved, they still have to go through the process of having the final plat approved. Okay. And so they, the, I believe Mr. Kern and his client would like to see this language clarified so that as they move forward in developing their property, they don't feel this uncertainty when they get to the end of the process and have the final plat approved. Process. Because that is a public process, does require P&Z recommendation and then uh, council approval. Well, since I'm not sure, I totally understand it. And I, I think, think I'm fairly <laughs> smart. <laughs> I'll do my, I'll do my non-engineering best. Okay. Um, what the, individual who um, brought this to our attention was that there are two, in, in this case, there are two parts of this development. 
above 25 feet and below 25 feet. Okay. And the theory is that all of the runoff from any development above 25 feet has to stay above 25 feet. Any develop any runoff below 25 feet can stay below 25 feet. So they see the world as this kind of two-tier, think of it as the, um, the chessboard on Star Trek. You know, it's got two levels. Right. So <laughs> they want all the water that runs on that top level to stay there and all the water that's on the bottom level. Well, you could put it up to, if you want to pump it to the top, they don't care. But basically, all that water on the top has got to stay above. Okay, if my logic says the part on the top should come down to the part on the bottom. <laughs> well, that is, that's how our engineer sees it. And in this case, there's even wetlands that are actually at the bottom below 25. And it appears that the runoff from the above 25 is naturally going into and feeding those wetlands, which are supposed to be maintained on site. However, we have this issue as to whether it's 25 feet as it stands today or 25 feet when it's developed. I think we need to clarify it. That's why what Mr. Kern <laughs> is asking, yes. And I don't think staff disagrees with that um, at all. Okay. Our intent is to make sure that the water um, source for the city of Titusville continues to be um, maintained. maintained. We just want to make sure that we do it in a way that everybody can read it and say, I know what that means. Did I do a good job? Very good. Okay, um, and, okay. our, and, I like and, and I believe the intent of our design is to actually increase and enhance your uh, recharge. The, the exact wording of this particular clause could be interpreted two different ways, and that's where the um, okay. problem is at. So, Ms. Pasaka, how do we resolve this? Well, I, I believe that it, you give us advisability tonight. We will work with uh, people who are more knowledgeable than I am about hydrology and engineering and come back to you with a recommendation that is clear and protects the recharge area. I have one right on the Jordan. I'm sitting here just looking at you. I, I, I guess the, the, you said something that concerned me. You said a citizen came and brought this up. And because that citizen came and they have expertise in this that citizen believes so, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm that is so there. politically you. correct. <laughs> yeah. I, to me, it, it just seems like it, it's pretty simple when it comes down to that area, no matter if it's 25 feet or 100 feet, the water's going to stay there. And that's the requirement, right? That's the intent. We believe that's, that's the, the intent. intent of the code. Okay, so if, if, if the intent of the code is to ensure that all the water stays on the property, whether it's 25 feet or 100 feet, it's gonna be there. The question really is if he adds 25 feet or move everything above 25 feet, like I think you, you said, right? Isn't that what you said? Well, we, we are, we are raising the ground raise it up, above right. that, yes. Right, and that water is still gonna stay there. Yes, also. absolutely. All right. So you're going to, with the advisability, you're going to bring a hydrologist in to try to figure out if that's going to the water We're going to clear. We're going to make sure that the language clarifies this and fulfills the intent of the code, which is to maintain the recharge in that aquifer. Okay. And and if it takes meaning uh, getting a hydrologist to help us, then we will do that. If an engineer can help us, then we will do that. But we want to be technically sound when we return to you with language. Okay. How, is this going to impact your schedule? Your We're stopped. Schedule? You're stopped. Totally stopped. So how long is this going to take for us to? Well, we don't have any meetings in June, so um, I'm hoping that we can get it done by the first in July. I mean, we have one meeting in June, but I can't advertise in, fast in enough. In your to do first that. Um, comprehensive plan amendment, that's about a two-month process. <clears throat> well, that, a little bit longer even, but yeah, it'll take, it'll take us several months just from advertising requirements. The alternative to going through this whole process is to what? Stick uh, with your- To move with, forward. Right. And to then know that this is preliminary plat. After the construction is completed, the final plat would have to be approved by this council. 
and have to go through the planning and zoning, and it's that public hearing process which adds a layer of uncertainty to all of this. But you would still need to go and get the information verified. Yes, sir. So it's better to start it and get it over with. And, and, and we've met with, with this um, client, with Mr. Kern and his client, and they understand the uncertainty. Um, nobody is happy about the way this is going, but we're doing our best to provide certainty for the project because they are going, they have quite a large investment right. if they start construction. Okay. Okay. Uh, I see no other lights. Somebody want to make a motion on this? Move to approve advisability on that section. <laughs> you, 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 you get it. Right. Second. I have a motion to second. Any other discussion? If not, all those in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed, like sign, passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Uh, next item is petitions and requests from the public. Any members of the that hmm? you, you are on that? That was a petition. Oh, that, what is, okay. Is there anyone else, let me rephrase, that would like to speak under petitions and requests? I see none. Uh, with that, I w we have finished this meeting. I will declare this meeting over. It will, next meeting will start at uh, 740, I mean 640.